staff don't have time to provide that sort of support for you. So if I need something in the middle of the night, because there's only one nurse responsible for 170 patients, I wait a very, very long time. Well, we need more people on the floor and we want those people to be trained to be able to handle and to interact with people, some of whom may have uh, dementia of some kind, but who can still, who can still uh, talk to you. I mean, um, half the time I will go and visit Dad and there's no one to be seen in his hallway. Um, when people need to go to the, to the bathroom, sometimes they have to wait for five or ten minutes to get someone to attend. There are always sensors kind of pinging. You know, people have sensor mats on their beds. They can be just pinging away and who knows when someone's actually going to come and attend that. There's just not enough staff. Although I am aware that he would often be neglected while staff cared for other residents, Additionally, I had requested from staff a weekly call to keep me updated on my dad's condition and time at the regional facility. However, I never received a call. There was no one around to help my mum. I ran around the facility doing laps of the corridors trying to find a nurse or just someone to assist. I felt quite panicked at this stage and my sister and I were pretty much were taking turns running around um, looking for help and then one of us would stay with mum. This went on for at least 30 minutes before we could find someone to help us. Even when we were able to find people, we felt they did not know how to handle the situation. It, it seemed it became a problem, a staffing issue. Um, did they have the staff that were tall enough or willing enough to bring in even a commode or even walk her to the bathroom? It wasn't going to happen. And she said to me one night she, she used the, the diaper and I said, well, Mum, why didn't you ring the bell? She said, I did ring the bell, but nobody came. In my opinion, there was insufficient staffing at the facility. We are told that everyone is an individual and has to be treated with respect. As care workers, we completely agree with this statement. However, we repeatedly find ourselves with such a heavy load, workload that we just have to manage a situation, that we can't give the residents the time that we would like. Yeah, most times, most nights I don't leave when at nine o'clock finish, I'll stay back and if there's a resident we're halfway through looking after, you just don't leave, you stay there and you finish caring for them. If you're there by yourself with 40 people and you have four call buses going and this lady needs to go to the toilet, you're there with this lady by yourself. The other three people, unfortunately, you can't get to when they need to be get, they need help. If you've got a person on the floor, you're completely taken off the floor with that person and the registered nurse when they come, say your other 39, I'm sorry. So you don't know if they're wandering, there's people at risk you're supposed to check, you can't get to them physically. I would look after 20 to 60 residents, um, our care staff have the same um, volume issues, so we can't give the time and attention that each person deserves. All the duties that we had to do and the time that was allocated, there wasn't time and we were discouraged from developing relationships. We were pretty much class as multi-skilled. We do the, the cleaning and the, the personal care, uh, escorting clients to different appointments. Um, we might get them ready to go on a respite bus for the day. Um, um, there's meal prep. Um, assisting medication, um, which is which is done by the chemist in a Webster pack, um, for us to assist to make sure that and, and remind clients to take that medication as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We need to be actually filling their needs as human beings, and um, so much time happens where people are sitting alone in a room, or even sitting in a community room where they don't have any interaction with one-on-one um, -on -one with people and um, as a person working in dementia care I find that really confronting and disturbing. I can be the only person that, that they will see all week or three times a week depending on how many times I go to that client um, and some of them don't leave their house so they don't go out anywhere. Um, it's, it's really hard sometimes 
because they go there and they want you to stay. They want you to talk to them. And that just to have someone, apart from a television, talking to them, someone that's going to answer them back and they'll tell you stories about when they were little. The problems are two. One is the hours I've referred to. The other is the variable quality of staff they send. They, some of them are largely untrained. Constant change of worker, so many really unqualified people. They did not know what to do in the house. What we know from the experts and what we know from other research is that staff that are unable to recognise, unable to manage um, residents with dementia um, potentially or often escalate situations. Staff are usually time pressured. The ability to manage someone with dementia requires a certain level of education and training, which I don't believe exists in the personal care workforce and probably doesn't exist even with um, the nursing staff and doesn't exist within the medical staff. Another area that I think is really important is staff training. Every resident is different. Aged care workers need to be trained to understand how different illnesses work and to understand their different characteristics. But what I am seeing is that the qualified staff is very limited. So then now you've got um, trained staff that have just completed university, whether Division 2 or Division 1, being in charge of 30 people. They haven't got the knowledge or the training to deal with the staffing issues, um, the rostering issues, and, and directing personal care workers to complete tasks. I also think that the workforce, I mentioned the workforce has huge challenges with consistency of staffing, with high levels of casuals, the transient workforce, accessing skilled workers out in, in rural and remote uh, parts of the country. I think that's an issue. Comments earlier around attracting people to the workforce is something <coughs> particularly um, pertinent in these areas. And the message that I would like to get out there is around the um, amazing experience and challenge that people have in working in these locations. Um, the, the calibre of the staff that we get out there, we have very committed people that are out there, but it's, it's few and far between that people want to come to these locations. Yeah, rurally I just... I don't think there's a huge incentive for staff to go other than a small locality allowance. Mm. There's not a huge incentive or draw card for professionals to advance their career in the rural areas. <clears throat> the workforce must be professionalised to improve standards and quality of care. And yes, that means regulation and appropriate funding and remuneration. It means developing proper career pathways to attract and retain the best employees. It is expensive and it's going to become more so as the baby boomers enter the system, but change must come and it must come quickly. In the model that is currently in the system, I'm not able to use my clinical skills to treat the problems that are at hand in these people. You don't learn or progress in your physiotherapy skills working in aged care, so I think there's a huge lack of motivation, a lack of, of, of um, yeah, basically motivation to, to go into aged care because people know that they will not be using any of the skills that they have learnt as a physiotherapist to improve people's quality of life. It's all very, it's very passive. We don't um, improve function. We don't help people to gain a better sense of independence, and it, it's almost... When people know, I've spoken to students who are past, present and um, future about a prax in aged care. We, most people do tend to have a, a practical placement throughout their degree. Everyone just, it's the worst attitude towards it. So people will just say, I cannot believe that I have to go to this prac for five weeks. It's going to be, you know, such a drag. It's not, I'm not looking forward to it because you don't learn anything. It's, it's static. Mm -hmm. It's passive. For the work that we do, um, the pay doesn't, doesn't reflect that <coughs> at all. And I'm not saying we're asking for FIFO wages, that would be ridiculous, but it definitely needs to... I've always said it needs to be an industry that wants to attract people as opposed to people just taking an aged care job because they can't get anything else or it's just something for them 
you know, to pay the bills, because then you could attract the wrong kind of workers, which I'm aware of any industry can. But you need to... It needs, um, like, a major overhaul. And it's wages and training, because, as I said, we don't come in this industry to be rich. We come in this industry because we care, we genuinely care about people. What makes it so rewarding is that you know that you're impacting, you're having a positive impact um, on each individual's life, daily life, their daily living. Um, and if you can be that one person to make that change on a daily basis, then that's a wonderful outcome. Um, not only for you know my personal satisfaction, my professional development, um, and giving that back to the community, giving that back to the workforce, and also mentoring younger um, younger staff members, yes. just the younger generation in general, showing them that aged care is it's a great place to be. It is a wonderful place to be. It is so rewarding, and you know what? You just keep going every day.